Nelson Mandela was sent to prison in 1964. When he emerged 27 years later, Mandela faced his former captors, the white South African government, as a political opponent rather than an outlaw. Many hoped his release would signal a quick end to the struggle for liberation. But the next four years would be among the bloodiest and most painful for all South Africans, black and white, as they struggled toward the transition to majority rule. Here is the final chapter of Mandela, an audio history. For the first time in 78 years, the African National Congress is talking to the white minority government. Its leader, Nelson Mandela, publicly welcomed by the president who freed him less than three months ago. We are here as fellow South Africans convinced that the system of white minority rule must come to an end without delay. From the early 60s, in the minds of most of the whites of this country, Mandela was simply regarded as a terrorist. And now I must sit with his men around a table. To start negotiations with a government which had throughout the years repeated that they would never sit down and talk to a terrorist organization was a highly sensitive matter. When we started negotiations, Mr. Mandela, his very first opening statement for at least 20 minutes or more, he made a study of the Afrikaner history, merely telling us, look, I know you, and I respect what you've gone through. He didn't come up with a statement of bitterness, retribution. No. A man, after 27 years of being robbed of his freedom, and to then come forward and start negotiations on that basis, remarkable. There's no way you can argue against that. It was the, the work he'd done in this harsh prison of making it his business to get into the heart and the mind of his adversary. And that's the key to everything. You've got to understand your adversary. After three days of historic discussions, first President de Klerk and then Mr. Mandela appeared to face the press together. Their handshake, evidence of the progress made. It didn't come easily. We had breakdowns, we had setbacks. People would storm out of meetings. But things seemed to be going well until fairly early in 1992, we had total breakdown. Good evening. Prospects for peace are fading. At least 31 people have died since violence erupted in Soweto yesterday. The most powerful image of violence in South Africa is no longer a confrontation between black and white, but between black and black. The more conservative Zulus, led by Chief Gotcha Budalese, challenge Mandela's right to speak for all blacks. Blacks are killing blacks in a steadily worsening tribal war. Cars and houses torched, an alleged Inkata supporter necklaced with a burning tire. A policeman sobbed outside his blazing home, set alight by neighbors who accused the police of involvement in the massacre. There was widespread violence. Many, many people were killed. The military security forces and the police were engaged in this. They were providing weapons. They organized raids. They constituted what Mandela called a third force. Nelson Mandela accused the government of complicity in the killings. The large rally cheered as Mr. Mandela announced that he'd suspended talks with the government. The negotiation process is completely in tatters. I can no longer explain to our people why we continue to talk to a government which is murdering our people. That war between the Zulu tribe and left-wing blacks has become a lot deadlier in recent days, and that is bound to make whites in this country even more anxious. Widespread violence to go with their now uncertain political and economic future. The reaction of white South Africa was, as usual, divided. Many left-wing whites would join Nelson Mandela's ANC, but most are in the expanding center, the majority who accept change but are worried. The whites simply were afraid of giving up 
the power that they had, that they exercised for more than 300 years. And they could see this slipping sort of out of their hands. And some of the right-wingers, the white right-wing, tried to derail the process. Approximately 10.25 this morning, Mr. Hani drove up to his house, got out, and at the same moment, another car stopped behind Mr. Hani's car. Shots were fired by a white man at close range. Chris Hani was the head of Mkonte Wessis, where the armed wing of the ANC, immensely popular person. He would draw the biggest crowd of any leader in the country, Mandela included. I'm unfortunate to announce that Mr. Hani has, has been killed instantly. When he was shot down after he'd been out jogging, there was an extraordinary eruption of anger in the country. That was the most terrible moment. There have been numerous incidents of rioting and other violence. And to report on the situation in Durban, we have Dirk Dippenard reporting from a portable phone. In Durban, I'm in the city centre, and it is a riot. The police have now cocked their rifles. The mob is starting to run back. There's chaos in the centre of Durban right now. Hundreds of policemen are coming out. They've got bulletproof vests on. Uh, an ANC marshal. Hello, Dirk. President de Klerk and uh, the government realized that they were now powerless to control the situation. And that very night, Mandela went on television to appeal to the country for calm. We say to all South Africans, black and white, this killing must stop. Our pain and anger is real. Yet we must not permit ourselves to be provoked by those who seek to deny us the very freedom Chris Hani gave his life for. It was his intervention on television that kept the country calm. That night, effectively, Mandela became president of the country. On the final day of campaigning in South Africa's non-racial election, a huge explosion has caused death and injury near the Johannesburg offices of the African National Congress. No one has claimed responsibility, but it's assumed to be the work of the far right, which has threatened to disrupt the election. The effect of this kind of action may well be to deter people from voting. It was a very explosive situation right in the final days of the transition. I mean, nothing in South Africa has ever been dull. We went to the brink several times, but there was no way of going backwards. It's 7 o'clock on the morning of the 27th of April, 1994. Polling stations have opened and thousands of people queue up to cast their vote at ballot stations. And we see that Mr. Mandela is busy casting his vote at this moment. In many black and coloured areas, queues began forming at four o'clock this morning as first-time voters streamed to the polls. Thousands of people were already queuing before seven o'clock outside polling stations at Soshanguve near Pretoria and at Soweto. The Red Cross said people should wear a hat, take a bottle of water, a snack and some boiled sweets in case of long delays. Yeah, well, it was a crazy day. I had to think, I mean, that I had to wait until I was 62 years of age. Nelson Mandela was 76 years of age before we voted in the land of our birth. A man of 101 years old voted for the first time at Addo in the Eastern Cape last night. Although unable to say much, the man appeared jubilant. It just was overwhelming to see all these people in long queues who couldn't even complete their voting in the one day. It had to continue the next day. And we're prepared to stand there in the sun and rain and to travel miles to go and put an X against a name. And I wondered to myself, 
What is it about casting a vote? I, Nelson Holisasa Mandela, do hereby swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. Huge crowds. The day when Nelson Mandela was inaugurated, the first democratically elected president of South Africa. And to devote myself to the well-being of the Republic and all its people. Will you please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. And you sat there and you looked at the benches of the newly elected legislators and there were all these terrorists as they had been regarded by the former apartheid government and there they were sitting. Many had been on Robben Island, many had been tortured and many of us kept having to pinch ourselves to say, no man, I'm dreaming. On that day, everyone who was at the inauguration will admit that the most exciting thing of that day was when the, the jets, just at the right time, they flew over the crowd. I think it was just the idea of people suddenly realizing in mass that those are now ours. They don't belong to the white apartheid regime anymore. They belong to us, to all the people. We are the government now. <laughs>